We all know that the climate is changing now as a result of human activity. However, the Earth has gone through many natural changes that I want to explore in this video. The climate has been changing over time on our planet, as far as we can tell, since the formation of our planet. We know this because scientists who study paleoclimatology can look at these changes in tree ring cycles, determine more recent changes for trees that have long lifespans like sequoias, and look at the gases that are trapped in ice cores for slightly longer time spans. These scientists can look even farther back by analyzing sedimentary rocks to look at the history of climate on the planet way past um, from what data is available from trees and ice cores. What we've learned is that climate change, when occurring naturally, is a relatively slow process. We do have examples of the climate changing quickly, however, due to natural causes. For example, there were rapid climactic changes that resulted from the asteroid impact that caused the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Don't feel too bad about that because that extinction opened up multiple niches for mammals, which at the time of the dinosaurs were small shrew-like creatures. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, these mammals diversified into what eventually led to, well, you. These sorts of environmental changes result in massive habitat changes. This is an example of an episodic and random climate event. They occur at irregular intervals and are more or less unpredictable. There are ecological disturbances that are periodic, meaning they occur relatively frequently and are more or less predictable. Grassland ecosystems, for example, see naturally occurring fires approximately every five years. Now, we'll come back to these a little later in the video, so I want you to keep these sorts of uh, periodic changes, especially in grassland ecosystems, in the back of your mind as we continue through this video. When these sorts of climate changes happen, organisms really have three options. Organisms must be able to alter their behaviors, move to a different region, or, well, perish. There is one common adaptation that many species have evolved to deal with seasonal changes. For example, many species of birds will migrate south for the winter and return back for the summer. But it's hard to call seasonality a disruption. One of the more recent natural changes that has occurred is the end of the last ice age, which ended about 11,000 years ago. That change was more or less due to slight changes in the Earth's orbit that resulted in the polar ice caps getting a little bit more sunlight, causing the ice to melt and change the climate. What I want to point out now, though, is just because the Earth has changed in climate naturally over its entire lifespan doesn't mean the climate change that we are observing due to anthropogenic forces isn't serious. See, climate changes in Earth's history have happened relatively slowly, even the fast ones from the dinosaurs. What we're seeing now is rapid change. Change that's happening so quickly that we've never observed before, and we don't really know what's going to happen to our ecosystems and our biosphere, or even any Earth system. That's why we take climate change seriously, and it's why you're going to have an entire unit on it later on. Part of the good news is, is that many ecosystems are rather resilient in the face of ecological disturbances that are well, comparatively mild in scale. This sort of resiliency thinking is growing in the ecological lexicon. Scientists like to think of the functioning of an ecosystem like this rolling ball model. Every ecosystem is resilient to certain disturbances like fires or major storms, floods, droughts, and other relatively minor disturbances. The key to understanding this concept is the threshold. 
or the amount of damage an ecosystem can withstand before the species composition and functioning of the ecosystem irreparably changes. Major changes in biodiversity can, of course, occur from these climate changes, but sometimes seemingly minor changes in the energy flow and species composition of an ecosystem can have large repercussions. In one of the most impactful papers ever published in the field of ecology, famed zoologist Robert Payne wondered what would happen if he removes a top predator from a shoreline ecosystem. He removed Pisaster, a type of sea star. What he observed was a paradigm shift in ecological thought. The biodiversity present in the plots of land where the sea star was removed saw biodiversity drastically lower. What that starfish did was control the population of other predators and certain bivalves. Without the sea star present, the best competing species quickly took over the landscape and excluded the other species. We call species like this sea star a keystone species. A keystone species is a species on which other species in an ecosystem largely depend on, such that if it were removed, the ecosystem would change drastically. One more species concept you should be familiar with is an indicator species. When studying the health of an ecosystem, there are particular species a scientist would look for to get a quick idea of the health and quality of an area. Species with a narrow ecological tolerance curve are useful to scientists because they are intolerant to polluted or degraded ecosystems. In many pond and river ecosystems, for example, if the nymph stage of a stonefly or dragonfly are found, Scientists know the ecosystem is healthy because these species cannot survive in polluted and degraded areas. On the other hand, if species like sludge worms and maggots with a wide tolerance curve are found in the absence of those nymphs, it's an indication that the ecosystem may be damaged in some way and may warrant further study. So we've looked at changes in environmental conditions and biodiversity in the context of disturbance. But there is also an expected progression in how ecosystems change over time as they develop. Ecological succession is the gradual process by which ecosystems change and develop over time. Let's take a look at this expected process. Let's say we have an area that is totally barren of living things, a fresh start. Very resilient organisms that have few habitat requirements will colonize this bare rock. Lichens are an example of one of these species. And lichens are a composite organism. That's actually not one species. They arise from algae or cyanobacteria that live among multiple fungal species in a sort of mutualistic relationship. These communities secrete chemicals that break down rock in a process we call biological weathering. This weathering is further aided by the mechanical weathering we've learned about before as water and wind further break down the rock. This is the first step to soil formation. As this happens, and as small layers of soil are built, other hardy plant species like perennial flowers and grasses will begin to colonize the area. We call these organisms pioneer species. We call these organisms pioneer species, which are the first to colonize barren environments. As these organisms live, die, and decay, they continue to contribute to the nutrient content and depth of the soil. After some time, there's enough soil to support larger plants like shrubs. This process of decaying plants continues to build depth and soil quality until softwood trees like evergreens can establish. These trees continue the soil building process. Eventually, these species give way to hardwood tree species that outgrow and outshade the shrubs and evergreens, resulting in a climax community. A climax community is the final stage of succession, 
remaining relatively unchanged until destroyed by an event such as a fire or some sort of human interference. What's interesting to note is that climax communities have slightly less biodiversity than transitional communities preceding them. This is because many of the understory grasses, flowers, and shrubs, and pines are outshaded by hardwood species like maples and oaks, which are better at competing for light and nutrients. We call this process of ecosystem development primary succession. The successive changes in ecosystem structure occurring in an environment in which new substrates, devoid of vegetation and other organisms, usually lacking soil, such as a lava flow or area that came from a retreated glacier, is deposited. Now, what if a disturbance like a fire well, burns through the climax community? Well, the soil is still there, and a similar process begins. Secondary succession is a type of ecological succession in which plants and animals recolonize a habitat after a major disturbance, like a flood or fire. The two biggest differences between primary succession and secondary succession is that secondary succession begins without the need to uh, begin the soil formation process. The soil is already there. So as a result, it happens much quicker. Remember earlier when I said to keep fires and grassland ecosystems in the back of your mind? Now, what would you expect to happen to a grassland ecosystem if frequent fires didn't occur? Ecosystems like grasslands and savannas would eventually give way to a forest community. These sorts of ecosystems actually are adapted to and rely on frequent ecological disturbances. Now, because humans generally prefer fires not to happen uncontrollably, we suppress natural fires and instead do controlled burns in these ecosystems in about the same frequency as it would happen naturally. So don't always think of an ecological disturbance as inherently bad for an area. Some ecosystems rely on these sorts of disturbances.